Good morning and welcome to New Work Baptist Temple. 273 in your hymnals. It's just like his great love. Let's stand as we sing. A friend I have called Jesus, his love is strong and true, and never fails how it is right, no matter what I do. I sin against this love of his, but when I know to pray, confessing all my guilt to him. like Jesus to roll the clouds away. It's just like Jesus to keep me day by day. It's just like Jesus all along the way. It's just like his great love. Sometimes when clouds of trouble blot out the sky above, I cannot see my Savior's face, I doubt his wondrous love, but he from heaven's mercy seat, beholding my despair, I love remove the clouds between, and shows me he is there, it's just like Jesus to roll the clouds away, it's just like Jesus to keep me day by day. It's just like Jesus all along the way. It's just like his great love. Oh, I could sing forever of Jesus' love divine. Of all his care and tenderness for this poor life of mine. like Jesus to roll the clouds away. It's just like Jesus to keep me day by day. It's just like Jesus all along the way. It's just like his great love. Amen. I'm so happy to see each of you here this morning. This happens to be a Sunday where I think we actually have more regularly attending family units out of church today than any day this summer, which is too bad because we have a fantastic preacher and his wife with us today that we have enjoyed at marriage retreat already up in Amish country on Friday and Saturday, those of us who registered for that. But I do see we have a number of guests with us today, and that makes me so happy because especially if this is your first impression of Newark Baptist Temple, you're going to be impressed. <laughs> and then I hope you'll come back next Sunday in the next. But anyway, it's going to be good preaching this morning, and the Lord's really going to help us out through the preaching of his word, so you're in a good place. Isn't it wonderful to start out singing about Jesus? Yes, amen. You know, you start thinking about Jesus, doesn't matter how, how you feel, doesn't matter what's going on in life, doesn't matter the problems in life. You start feeling about Jesus, you're, going, you're thinking about Jesus, you're going to start feeling better. If you, if you look at Jesus and see him for who he really is and what he's really done for you, you can't help but be encouraged by the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to prayer this morning and ask God to help us from his word. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning in gratitude for all that you've done to meet our needs through your word in the past. Father, we're thankful for your timing, for your sovereignty, for your purposes and, Lord, we're grateful to know that even when we feel like things are a bit out of control, you've never been out of control. And, Lord, we're glad this morning we can trust you and have confidence that you are working not only your will, but you're working our best. And, Father, we thank you that you brought us to this place this morning where you, we can hear your word preached. And I pray, Lord, that you'd open each of our hearts to your word and that we would allow your Holy Spirit to come in and to minister truth to us, to convict where we need to be convicted, to convince, to... Um, to in, exhort, to, to encourage. And Lord, I pray whatever the needs are that are represented here today, that your spirit would meet those needs through your word. But Father, fill us with your spirit as uh, Christians who listen, make us an attentive 
to your word. And Father, if there's anyone here this morning who knows not Christ as Savior, may they come to appreciate this morning all that is available in the Lord Jesus who died in our place, who took our punishment, who took our sin and nailed it to his cross so that we could be forgiven and right with you. Help us as we worship you this morning to do it in spirit and truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Take your hymnals to page 1904, a thousand tongues to sing. Let's stand as we sing. they do let me just mention a couple things to you first of all in the seat back in front of you you'll find a couple different things one of the things you'll find is this yellow envelope if you would like to have a part in uh, honorarium for our speaker who will be with us to this morning and this evening if you would simply write the word speaker or special speaker on the outside of that we'll know that that's what you intend that for and we'll make sure that's part of our honorarium to him uh, when the day is over with and then also if you're visiting with us today especially if you're first time 
visitor, in the seat back in front of you, you'll find uh, a set of connection cards where you can request prayer for something. If there's something you'd like for us to pray about, maybe make a comment on the service or even just in ask information about the church or its ministries. You can fill that out, drop it in the offering plate as it passes or hand it to one of us after the service is over with. It'd be a great way for us to get to know you. I, um, I know it's overwhelming when you come to a new place and you don't know everybody's names and we don't want to make you feel overwhelmed, but uh, when you're as old as I am, when you're 47, you can still forget names. And once I, once I see it on a piece of paper, that helps me. So if you do nothing else but just give me your name, that would be a great help. And I hope that you'll use those connection cards for that purpose this morning. Our missionaries of the week are the Suttons, new missionaries on deputation to Nicaragua. Let's pray for them every day this week. Pray also for Lighthouse Legal Ministries here in the state of Ohio. I just had the opportunity actually last week to call and get some legal advice. Don't worry, we're not being sued or anything. But I was able to get some legal advice for the ministry from them, and we're thankful for their work. Brother Rob Robodeau is the attorney there with Lighthouse Legal now. Let's pray for their work as we go to the Lord in prayer for this offering. Remember our missionary and ministry partners. Brother Harlow, would you lead us in prayer, please, sir? Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you for the gathering together. We think the Sutton's order is prepared to go into your mission field there in Nicaragua, Lord, and we can guide and direct their efforts there, Lord. Also, pray, just pray for Lighthouse Legal Ministries, Lord, and the advice they give pastors and churches. Thank you. 
please make sure you look at your bulletin this morning and notice a couple opportunities to fellowship. Next Sunday evening, we are planning something after the service we're calling the Cookies and Cream Fellowship. So this, we'd like to have finger foods too, so you don't have to eat dessert before you eat supper. Uh, but if you would uh, plan to bring cookies, the church is going to provide an assortment of flavors of ice cream, and we'll have plenty of it. And uh, so let's make this our last two raw before school starts. Uh, again, church fellowship after church next Sunday evening, the 21st. And then tonight, uh, the Plessingers are having a, a graduation party slash farewell. I hate the word farewell. Um, see you later um, party for Dottie, who will be heading off when Garrett heads back to Crown. Dottie's heading down to Crown as well, Crown College of the Bible in Powell, Tennessee. And so in the library tonight, they will have that event after church tonight, and the church family is invited to come and share in their refreshments and uh, wish um, Dottie well as she heads off to college and congratulate her on her high school graduation as well. One more thing, Brother Vaughn will probably say more about this. There's a book table in the hallway today and many good resources for your home and your walk with the Lord, so I hope you'll check that out as you leave today. I'll say, the events are free 99, so why not come, right? Free food. Can't go wrong with that. All right, 310, the old rugged cross. Let's stand one last time. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the tears and past for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll for me, for the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross. I will My steps are guided by your hand. You know
know when I rest and when I stand. Each breath I take is by your command. Your love will always hold me, guide me and enfold me. Praise your name, praise your holy name, eternal should ride the wings of dawn or go to the depths of the sea. And if I rise to the highest heaven, there your love will hold me, guide me and enfold me. Pray your name, praise your holy name, eternal Father, creator of heaven and earth, you are Jehovah, holy one of Israel, mighty God, the great I am, you As I mentioned earlier, we've had Brother Vaughn, Harold and Debbie Vaughn with us from Virginia for our marriage retreat held out at the Dutch Host Inn in Sugar Creek this week. And the five messages that we heard on Friday night and Saturday morning have been a great help to me already and I'm confident will be helpful to our homes. We're glad to have him stay over for Sunday to preach this morning and this evening. They've been married for 42 years and they have three sons, adult sons, and five grandchildren. Uh, yes, and I'm sure, I'm sure they have pictures they'd be glad to show you as well and stories they'd be glad to tell you, but we appreciate him. This morning, I got a text from our friend Dave Young who said, you're about to hear one of my favorite preachers preach. And uh, so for those of you that know Brother Young, you know that's going to be some good preaching if it's Brother Young's favorite preacher. So Brother Vaughn, come share with us what the Lord has for you this morning. Thank you, Brother. Appreciate that so much. Well, horse and buggies in Berlin and Dodge Hemis in Heath. What about that? That's this... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All those hot rods going up and down the road. That's really something, isn't it? But anyway, what a blessing to be here. Dave Young's a friend of mine. I'm really glad to be in Bethley Young's home church. And uh, what a blessing. Sure have enjoyed being with your pastor and Sherry. Just been really great. And this morning we trust that uh, you're anticipating a bless blessing from God. I want to talk to you this morning from my heart about revival in the home. You know, revival will not start in the White House. It must start in the church house. 1 Peter 4, 17 says judgment must begin in the house of God. The Bible doesn't say the judgment must begin in Washington, D.C. It does not say judgment must begin in San Francisco. It does not say judgment must begin at the national headquarters of Planned Parenthood. 
But it does say the judgment must begin in the house of God. I believe we're long overdue for judgment to begin in the house of God. We have too much preaching that strokes the emotions and too little preaching that strikes at the heart of our problems. Richard Owen Roberts said that preaching in America is basically designed to do one thing, offer people more comfort. That the basic purpose of the pulpit in America now seems to be to offer people a little more comfort. And they went on to say the only problem is most churches are already so comfortable, you would think they were engaged in a sleeping contest. You know, I travel all over. I'm telling you, churches, uh, by and large, not all together, but uh, more about entertainment than intercession, uh, more about uh, programs than preparing fathers to shepherd their homes. You know, some people are worried about the issue of separation of church and state. I think we ought to get concerned about the issue of separation of church and God. Somebody asked one Christian leader, what's your comment on Christianity in North America? He said, well, it's definitely more American than it is Christian. Now, brother, sister, if we're serious about revival in the land, we're going to have to get serious about revival in the church. And if we're serious about revival in the church, we're going to have to get serious about revival in the home. The family is the building block of society. The reason our country is crumbling is because the family has, uh, is crumbling as well. So goes the home, so goes the nation. The family is of primary importance uh, when it comes to applying for leadership in a local church because the Bible teaches if a man is to give direction in a ministry, he must be able to give direction at home. So goes the church, so goes the nation. So goes the family, so goes the church. And so goes the father, so goes the family. I believe God's called the men to be three things, prophets, priests, and patriarchs. A prophet to guard his home, a priest to guide his home, and a patriarch to govern his home. We've got to get serious about revival in the home. I'm talking about my home. I'm talking about your home. Now listen, when marriage collapses in society, so does morality. When the God-ordained institution of matrimony goes by the wayside, there's an inevitable breakdown of the social order, and I believe the breakdown of the family is the mother of all social ills. But I believe that God longs to send revival in the home. Because he said in Malachi, he shall turn the hearts of the fathers. He shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and then turn the hearts of the children back to the fathers, God said, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Do you realize that disunity in the home brings a curse upon the earth? You know, spiritual delinquency, there's spiritual delinquency in the home long before there's juvenile delinquency in the streets. And whether our country believes it or not, the public interest really does depend upon private virtue. And I want to bring out a couple of texts here this morning, starting in 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1. Notice God's directives for the home. 1 Peter chapter 1, notice this if you would, uh, chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 1. What am I saying? 1 Peter chapter 3. I'm really tired this morning. Can anybody identify with this? <laughs> I hit the coffee shop would somebody slip out and give me another latte quickly? But anyhow, one, one, one Peter, <laughs> chapter three. Thank you. The hey, visitors, the good preachings next week. Come back next week. You're really coming. <laughs> first Peter. All right, First Peter, chapter three. Yes, and verse one. Yeah, look at this. So let's stand for the reading of the word of God, if you would, please. Notice these directives for wives and husbands. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation, the behavior of the wives, uh, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning or plaiting of the hair and wearing of apparel or putting on of gold, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament, listen to this, of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. Directives for wives. Notice the word to the men in verse 7. In fact, read it out loud with me. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, 
giving honor unto the wife as in the weaker vessel. Now, why are these directives to wives and husbands? Why are all of these directives given here in this text? Notice what he said here, that your prayers be not hindered. Disunity in the home not only brings a curse upon the earth, it brings a hindrance to prayer. And often when things are out of kilter in the home, often things are out of kilter with God. I don't have to tell you we're living in days of domestic confusion. I mean, good night, whoever dreamed. But here we're in the, here we're in the era of house husbands, uh, career mothers, and latchkey children. But in the middle of all of that, God says right here to wives, hey, this is the assignment. He says to the husband, this is the assignment that our prayers be not hindered. Father, give us revival in our homes. We believe and thank you in advance in Christ's name. All God's people say amen. You can be seated. Now, I don't have to tell you the families of America are in a crisis. I, I don't have to tell you that. 50% uh, of uh, marriages end in divorce. 64% of second marriages end in divorce. Let me just say this. I'm not here to heap guilt or shame on anybody that suffered the tragedy of a broken home. But what I'm going to say is give it in the spirit that an ounce of prevention is far better than a pound of cure. And boy, we need some preventative measures in these perilous days. I'm just telling you, 40% of children, they say, are born out of wedlock. Every 20 seconds, a spouse is, is abused. Two-thirds of all moms are in the labor force. The family is in a state of crisis. We can't even define the family. Now, in, in Leadville, Colorado, Planned Parenthood had a program where they were paying the teenage girls $1 every day they avoid getting pregnant. How many remember when... Uh, uh, good behavior was its own reward. Does anybody remember this? But here we are. Um, U.S. News and World Report did an article, I'm not making it up, called The Biological Roots of Good Mothering. The Biological Roots of Good Mothering. They sent somebody off to Africa to study gorillas to try to figure out how to prevent child abuse. You talk about a return to the planet of the apes. How crazy have we become in these days? Now, let me just say this to you. I'm not here to talk about redefining the family. I'm not even here talking about reinventing the family. But I would like to give a word of exhortation about reviving the family. And you know family problems are not new. I'm telling you, ever since the first home, there's been family problems. In Malachi, I think we have a text on this, Malachi chapter 2, notice God's last word to the covenant people of Israel. Yeah, there it is. Now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. If you will not hear, if you will not lay it to heart, to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you. I will curse your blessings. Yea, I have cursed them already because you do not lay it to heart. Read verse 3 out loud with me. Behold, I will corrupt your seed. Now, God didn't say the devil was going to corrupt your seed, their seed. Uh, he said he was going to do it. Now, what in the world could have happened uh, with the leaders of God's covenant people that was so severe that God said he's going to put a curse and corrupt their seed? What in the world could be wrong? Look at this next verse in, chapter, in verse 14. Notice what it says right here. Yet ye say, wherefore, because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom you have dealt treacherously, yet is she your companion, the wife of your covenant, and did he not make one? Uh, why did he bring them together? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit, and wherefore one? Why did he bring them together? That he might seek a godly seed. Take heed to your spirit, let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth pudding, Away. Now, let me just interpret this for you. Uh, the priest of Israel, the covenant people of God, had dealt treacherously with their wives. They had put their wives away. In other words, they had divorced them. They had taken on, in some cases, pagan wives. And God says he hates this breakup of the home. But in verse 15, he gives us the purpose of marriage, that he might seek a godly seed. You know, to those engrafted in a sacred trust, negligence is a crime. And we as parents have been engrafted in a sacred trust. Back in the day, our three boys were small. We went out to Yellowstone Park. And before we went out to Yellowstone Park, we got that 
Disney Wonderful World of Color video. How many remember the old, old, old videos? And this was on the Yellowstone Bears. And they had a problem back in the 60s with a bunch of pesky bears coming out of hibernation, making a beeline to the park entrance, uh, parking their car carcasses, sitting there, uh, waiting for handouts. So they had these, these uh, signs coming into the park, please don't feed the bears. Guess what people did with those signs? Same thing we do with speed limit signs. And they ignored them. So they would come in and hear these bears and they'd be feeding these bears. They had a picture of a lady with an upright bear, her arm around this upright bear with a chocolate chip cookie in the bear's mouth. Had one picture of a bear on top of the car and he was, he, he was going into the window this way and getting handouts, just sitting around all the time, uh, just sitting there. Welfare bears in uh, Yellowstone Park causing bear jams, having all kinds of problems. They finally had to relocate and shoot some of the bears. And somebody said to the park ranger, what is wrong with these bears? What is wrong with them? And the park ranger said, they've lost the reason for their existence. They've lost the reason for their existence. And you got to wonder sometimes if in middle class Christian America, Sometimes if we've not lost the reason for our existence. I'm telling you, God is after a godly seed. Now listen, strong families don't just happen. They've got to be built. So I'm going to give you a simple four foundation a stone message on how to build for a godly family and how to build for revival in the home. Foundation stone number one is radical, radical dedication. You know, we not only need family devotions, we need fam devoted families. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's radical dedication. You know, typically children tend to love what their parents love. Typically, not always, but typically. They tend to get excited about what their parents are excited about. So let's ask ourselves this morning, what are we excited about? Dodge Hemmings? Horse and buggies, <laughs> jobs, sports, money. Uh, what are we excited about? You know, I've met some parents and grandparents. I think they're more uh, worked up about getting the kid to Disney World than getting him into the family of God. And the Bible says where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We had a guy come from Ireland one time and spoke at our men's prayer advance. And we belonged to a church at that time that was a missions church. That church didn't give to missions. They sent their own missionaries. In the book of Acts, by the way, it was a local church who sent the missionary. It wasn't an agent. I'm just for what it's worth. It was a local church. So they, they took the responsibility. Our church gave seven, eight hundred thousand dollars at that time a year to missions. I know not everybody can do this, but they did. Now, uh, the guest speaker from Ireland had never been to the States. He went out to the mission board and he made this comment. He said, I'm surprised you don't have more of your own children on the mission field. That was his comment. He said, I'm surprised you don't have more of your own children on the mission field. You know, parents, children tend to love what the parents love. They tend to get excited about what the parents are excited about. And you know what? They tend to follow after us. Now listen, the spiritual condition of the home it's often a, re spir a reflection of the spiritual condition of the father. But can I encourage you? God can restore the years the locust have eaten. God can restore the years the locust have eaten. I was in Florida. 64-year-old man came up and gave me a note. He was a godly man. He had raised his children very thoroughly. And four, three of his four children had, had gone out into a cult. He prayed for 30 years. And after 30 years of intercession, God turned the hearts of his children and brought them back to the way of truth. God can restore the years the locusts have eaten, but how much better if the locusts don't have a shot at them in the first place? I want to encourage you. Isaiah 44, 3. Here's a text right here. Look at this right here. Read it out loud while I catch my breath. Read it out loud. For I will pour water. You talk about good news. He says he's going to pour water on who? He that is thirsty. 
You know the greatest need in fundamentalist churches is hunger and thirst for God. Can I get a witness on that right there? Not enough to go through the program and be in compliance. No, no, no. I will pour water on him that is what? Thirsty. I'll pour floods upon the what? Dry ground. Man, what a word of grace. Praise the Lord. But notice what he said here. He said, I will pour my spirit upon your what? Your seed and my blessing upon your offspring. Wow, that's the heart cry of every parent and every grandparent. That God would pour out his blessing and pour out his spirit upon our seed. General William Booth, founder of Salvation Army. Radical, radical, radical man. You know, he, he and his wife had uh, eight children. And he, it was his practice to go into the worst ghettos in London and around the country and stand up and preach the gospel. General William Booth was not a widely respected man in his day, but he was a radical man. He had eight children. Children tend to love what the parents love. And I'm sure as those children grew up in that home with that radical firebrand, I'm sure they longed for the day when they could accompany their father on these street preaching missions in the ghettos. But I'm sure they had to hold them back when they were young for security purposes. But can you imagine when the day came, they were deemed old enough to accompany their father to do what he loved to do. Can you imagine? They'd get out in the street and they'd go down there beating on the cans or whatever kind of racket they were stirring up singing and they would go into the worst part of the city and then the general would stand up and begin to preach. And here would come the heckles, here would come the cursings, here would come the rotten vegetables, here would come the tin cans being tossed at him. And I can imagine those children standing shoulder to shoulder with their father, proudly taking a rotten tomato in the face. Why? Because they loved what their father loved. They got excited about what their father was excited about. And you know what? Of those uh, eight children, all eight grew up to serve God as missionaries somewhere on planet Earth. And those eight children had 44 grandchildren. Wow, 40. Say amen, somebody. 44 grandchildren. I'm just telling you, I like these children, man. This is tremendous. But did you realize all 44 grew up to serve God as missionaries somewhere on planet Earth? A three-generation foundation. Why? Because of radical, radical dedication. Our own church was having a spiritual life crusade way back when. About 50 men showed up one Saturday night to pray. And I remember two men prayed, and then I, I, I listened, I listened. As an 11-year-old boy began to supplicate, he began to intercede, he began to heave, he began to weep, he began to beg God to pour out his spirit. He began to beg God to send a reviving presence and save people. I looked up, and that 11-year-old boy, he wasn't kneeling, he wasn't standing, he was flat on his face, sobbing his guts out. And I thought to myself, what better pray place for an 11-year-old to be on Saturday night than in the middle of a red-hot prayer meeting with his father, believing God to send his spirit. Now, I want to tell you something, friend. Uh, children are capable of deeper spiritual experience than some people think. And we don't need six flags over Jesus all the time. Sometimes we need to address our children and challenge them with serious spiritual truth. Radical, radical, radical dedication. Now, Mom and Dad, listen to me. Listen to me. My, my wife and I are not uh, experts on parenting. I could write an encyclopedia on mistakes and what not to do, all right? So don't think that you're the only one. You, we did the best we could. So here's what we need to do, Mom and Dad. Listen to me. Listen to me. Forget the past. Get to the cross. Get it under the blood. And then resolve to put God first and work from here on out and making our families what they ought to be. Radical dedication. Foundation stone number two is regular devotions. Regular devotion. Somebody said we need a compass in our hands, but a magnet in our hearts. Now, buddy, we've got a compass in our hands. Yeah. What we really need is a magnet in our hearts. You know, we've always had uh, personal and family devotions when our children came along. And uh, when our son, our youngest son turned two, we got him a toddler Bible. Have you ever seen a toddler Bible? It's not much Bible. It's mainly pictures with a little verse down there at the bottom. We got old Steve. He's two years old. Got him a toddler Bible. So here we are in our travel trailer, traveling around. Everybody's having devotions, mom and dad and his two brothers. And little old Stephen, he's two years old. He said, Michael, he said to his brother, hey, give me my toddler Bible. I want to have devotions too. Mm. So Michael said he gave him a Bible and he sat over on the couch. He can't read. 
he was over there flipping through, looking at the photographs and the pictures, and he was reciting the cat in the hat nursery rhyme. <laughs> cat sits in tub, cat eats cake, cat wears hat. <laughs> he was reciting the cat in the hat. And, and Michael came in and said, hey, Stephen was over there uh, reciting the cat in the hat for his uh, uh, personal <laughs> devotions. And you know what I said to my son? I said, yeah, my devotions weren't much better than his this morning. How about yours? How many know there's more to having devotions than going through the motions? Better be meeting God somewhere along the line. Men ought to always to pray and not to faint. They say 10% of professing Christians in America have uh, personal devotions. I'd say less than 1% of Christian families have family devotions. The pastor's Sunday school lesson was stellar. I, if you, you can look on that and look at that, I think. Somebody said that uh, they came up with a one-minute Bible. Have you ever heard of this? The one-minute Bible for busy Christians. You know what I say? If you don't have but one minute a day for God, why don't you try the Elks Club or the Moose Lodge? Because don't pretend to be a follower of the Lamb if you can only spare one minute a day with God. <clears throat> we have an immense prayer advance. We had a fellow come from South Africa. He was Afrikaans. That means he talked funny. And uh, he came from Africa, and he told the story as he grew up on this farm in South Africa. His father managed this massive farm. And then the African uh, natives, the, the brethren, they, they would come to this farm to go for whole nights of prayer on this mountain in South Africa. He said he was the first white guy they ever invited to go with them for a whole night of prayer. So he said they're walking up the mountain. He strolls up beside this African brother. He said, brother, how are we going to spend the night in prayer? And I'm sure what he was saying is, what in the world are we going to say to God all night long? You know what the African said? He said, brother, he said, white man, he said, your problem is you're in a hurry, but God is not. You're in a hurry, but God is not. Andrew Murray said, hurry is the death of prayer. Oh, my brother, oh, my sister, I want to tell you something. That um, radical dedication and, 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 and this matter of the devotional life. We had a prayer advance one time. We had a guy come from North Carolina, a pastor. He met the Lord before the thing ever started. I mean, God did something significant, substantial. It was incredible. And... Uh, he called me up two weeks later, and he said, Brother Harold, sir, he says, a heart attack. He said, Brother Harold, have you met with God today, brother? Whew. Well, I mean, that was a bit, uh, that, was a, that was a bit revealing. So I kind of turned the conversation in a different direction, trying to. And, and about five minutes later, he said, Brother Harold, I'm serious. Have you met with God today, brother? I said, well, to be honest, I read my Bible. I made a stab at praying. But I really didn't meet with God. He said, when you get off the phone, are you going to meet with God? I said, Brother Steve, if you'll hang up, I'm going to lock the door. Tell the secretary, don't bother me. I'm here to meet with God. How many know there's a difference between going through the motions of a devotional life and meeting with God? Listen, friend, Abraham, he pitched his tent, but he built his altar. He threw the tent up. But he built his altar. Our temptation is that we pitch our altars and we spend our whole lives building our tents. Remember the disciples came to Jesus. Remember when, when, when they, they were holding back these children from coming to Christ? You know, children liked Jesus. And Jesus liked children. Because he was blessing the children. Remember that? But the disciples wanted no part of it. And I think they wanted to see something more sensational. They'd, love, they'd much rather see a screaming demon come flying out of somebody or some uh, miraculous healing take place or something like that. So they're holding the children. They're holding them back. And remember what Jesus said? Suffer the little children to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. I believe Jesus knew in his heart that if he didn't bless them when they were young, he'd probably have to cast a demon out of them when they got older. And the time to get our children to God is not when they're 13 or 18. No, no, when they're 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That's the time. And brother, I just want to, Abraham built his tent, but he, uh, pitched his tent, but he built his altar. I want to ask you this morning, child of God, do you have an altar? 
Do you have a place where you meet with God daily? And a place where God meets with you? Uh, head of household, do you have a family altar? I believe if my children learn more about God in Sunday school than they do in my, did in my living room, then I was a colossal spiritual failure. I believe the father is to be the primary communicator of truth or the woman like with uh, Timothy, uh, Lois, and Eunice and all of that. Uh, the head of the household is to be the primary, not the only, but the primary communicator of truth to the children. Now one elderly Christian said to Augustine's mother, as Augustine was a reprobate, she said, the child of many prayers will never perish. The child of many prayers will never perish. Now listen, you might have some prodigals. You, know, you might have some that have strayed. Don't you be guilted. Don't you be shamed. Don't you be defeated. Don't you be faithless. The child of many prayers will never perish. God didn't give you children to populate hell. I don't believe that for a minute. And I believe the seeds that have been sown will spring to life. Devoted families. Foundation stone number three, respectability in daily life. Ooh, respectability in daily life. In Proverbs 31, there's a virtuous woman. Her children rise up and call her what? Say it out loud. That's a good word. Call her blessed. Why? She earned their respect. She earned their respect. In South Africa, Andrew Murray was to preach in one of these massive churches with the wraparound balconies and the elevated pulpits. And, and, and they went through the song service. They say the time came for Andrew Murray to mount the pulpit. You have to walk up about 12 feet. And they say as he stood, as he rose to mount the pulpit, a holy hush fell on the entire congregation such a sense of awe and the holiness and presence of God that the whole place sat in stunned silence except on the first row where a little girl elbowed her mother and whispered and said, Mommy, Mommy, is that the Lord Jesus Christ? Mommy, is that the Lord Jesus Christ? Respectability in daily life. We were in a meeting one time when an 85-year-old wife of a Bible college president she stood up and she said, you know, I've been more concerned about having a clean house than having a clean heart. More concerned about having a clean house than having a clean heart. You know, our children uh, were young and um, we always tried to have devotions of some sort, doing some, something, singing, reading, praying, something. We always tried to do something, but our children were very, very small and we had had a rough day around the Vaughn household. You probably never had one of these around your place. But um, it started out bad and got progressively worse. It started out a devastation and ended up a catastrophe. I mean, things that were said that should not have been said. Mm -mm -mm. Things were said that should have been said in a much different way. Mm. Uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was a disaster. Well, the end of the day came. We always do something. <laughs> So I, I said to my family, I gathered them around, my wife, and we only had two children at that time, and I said, uh, tonight, I couldn't even look them in the eye, in the flesh all day long. I, I said, uh, we're not going to pray tonight. We're not going to sing. We're not going to read the Bible. I said, tonight, we're going to confess our sins to God. And I'm going to start, and if anybody has anything to get cleansed of, we will just pray until we get clean. Let us pray. I started off with my initial list of confession of sins, which was quite lengthy, with no repetition. Then my oldest son fell in behind me, and he started confessing his sins. Then my second son, he started confessing his sins. Now, you don't, don't know my wife, but I'm just telling you, even my wife had to confess sins. Now, brother, when my wife has to confess sins at the end of the day, you know it has been a real bad day around the Ponderosa. I'm just telling you, it has been really bad. Well, that was round one, so that just sparked more conviction in me. So I, I let off in my second round. My oldest son, he fell in behind me. My second son fell in behind him. And even my wife, <laughs> which is incredible, even my wife, my wife is better by nature than I am by grace. 
she was more Christ-like uh, before she was converted than I am now. But even she had to confess some sin. She, she, she went two rounds and then, and then she dropped out and me and the boys took the ball and ran from there. So round three, here I am, my middle son, my first son, then my second son. And we kept praying around and around and around. And you know what was happening? Spiritual atmospheric cleansing. <laughs> I mean, we were getting all those barriers down. And the more we prayed, the better it got. And we finally got to the point where we had nothing left to put under the blood. And we shouted, amen. And my oldest son, he said, dad, dad. This is the best devotions we've ever had. Can we do this again sometime? That's what he said. And you know what? We've had to do that again sometimes. You know, you earn respect from your children by living the, the, the Christ life and then second by admitting when you've been wrong. You know, when your children are small, they think you're perfect. When they turn teenager, they realize you're not. How about that? And let me give you 10 words for revival in your home. 10 words for revival in your home. Uh, I was wrong, I am sorry, will you forgive me? Let's practice class, come on. I was wrong, I am sorry, will you forgive me? Older men join in. I was wrong, I am sorry, will you forgive me? Now brother, do you need to say that to anybody in your home? Ooh, ma'am, <laughs> sons, daughters, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, uh, we, we had a prayer advance one year, and this guy, pastor from South Carolina, he came, had a head-on collision with God, went home. He said, Harold, I went home and got right with my teenage children, got right with my wife, and he said, Harold, when I went to church on Sunday, God was there. I got a little tip. There'll never be revival in the church until there's revival in the home. His 17-year-old son was killed not long after that. But the consolation was he was clear with his son, putting things right. Oh, dear people, I was in Northern Virginia in this church, and all the children sat out in front. And, uh, <laughs> one of them came up and said, Harold, my father came to the prayer advance, and she said, ever since, we've been having family altar in our home. You know what I thought? <laughs> Never too late. The other one was being raised by her grandparents because her mother went in for counseling, and the counseling told this girl, the girl's mother, she had five children, told this girl's mother that she should take up relationship with her, uh, her lover and leave her family. And she's being raised by her grandparents. And you know what, what I thought? Isn't it wonderful that the grace of God can reach down into non-Sunday school situations and still redeem people for his own glory? Isn't that wonderful? And these girls were delightful. Oh, friend, I'm just telling you. Here it is. Here it is. Respectability in daily life. But number four, listen to this one. Relevant discipleship. Revival in the home. Relevant discipleship. Pastor addressed this excellently this morning. Discipleship begins at home. You don't have to go to a foreign country to make disciples. Start with your, your spouse, children, and grandchildren. Now I want to ask you a question, Mom and Dad. Who are your children's heroes? Whose posters are hanging on the bedroom wall? Whose music are they listening to? You know, we're called to shepherd the hearts of our children. Deuteronomy 6. These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. In your heart. Not your head. In your heart. And thou shalt diligently teach them to your children when you're sitting, walking, lying, or rising. We are in Michigan one time, and a guy stood up, and he said, you know, we're all the time talking about the commandments of God, but we never teach the commandments of God. I mean, you think home should not be an entertainment center, but a worship center. It, it, it really should be. And, and, friend, relevant discipleship. We have a weak nation because we have weak churches. Let's be candid here. We have weak churches because we have weak families. We have weak families because, by and large, not altogether, we have weak men. But you know, Joshua said, it's for me and my house. We, he didn't take a vote. He said, we're going to serve the Lord. When the father takes the lead, most often, most often, the family will follow. Now, we've been called by God to shepherd uh, the hearts of our children, to, to pastor our families. They say, one survey found the average father spends 47 seconds a day with his child. Incredible. Uh, the average child spends uh, hour after hour after hour on some sort of media. So one, one survey found 42% of 
Christian young people are watching MTV or the equivalent. Now, let me just say this. Friend, if you're looking to the Christian school to sanctify your child without your efforts, you're probably going to be sadly disappointed. If you're looking to the government to raise your children, you're really going to be disappointed. And if you're looking to a hot youth group to make sure your children turn out right, thank God for a hot youth group. Thank God for a Christian school. Thank God for all of that kind of stuff. But it's not the government's responsibility to raise our children. It doesn't take a village. It takes some parents and some godly people. It, it doesn't take, it, it's not the church's responsibility. It's the parents' responsibility to shepherd and parents parent the hearts of their children. It's time to take ownership of, responsibility for, and the control of our children. There's, there's, there's requirements and responsibilities connected uh, to the family. Train up a child, train him up, direct his steps in the way he should go. How many know the children shouldn't all go the same way because they're all different? Can I get a witness right here? Train him up in the way they should go, and when he is old, he will not depart with it from it. Though you beat him with a rod, he shall not die. It might sound like it, but they're going to outgrow this. Amen. And I'm not talking about child abuse. You know that's not what I'm talking about at all. There's got to be some discipline somewhere because God's got an order in the home. My wife and I are out preaching all over the country. We begin to go to these speaking schools and churches, and we were absolutely dumbfounded and devastated as we begin to see the retention rate among the faith and, and, and the people, the best, the best churches. And I said to my wife, I said, honey, if, we, if we're going to want a different result than what most are getting, we're going to have to do something different from what most are doing. So we begin to take measures. So we were bird dogging. Whenever we'd find somebody that looked like they had godly children, grown children, uh, we'd go up to them. I remember one, one time I went up to this lady. She was older, had four godly children, all serving the Lord, wonderful. And I said to her, I said, ma'am, can you give me some insight as to maybe why your children have a heart for God? You know what she said? Oh, Brother Harold, it's just the grace of God. <laughs> I said, well, yes, ma'am, I, I know it's the grace of God, but I... I am fairly desperate. Could you be a little bit more specific with some uh, insight? And she pondered. And she said, well, when my children were growing up, I never down-talked my husband in front of our children. And they took that respect for authority to the ultimate authority. One man said this. He said, I'm the boss in my home, but I'm not the leader. He knew how to bark out orders, but he didn't know how to shepherd the hearts Shepherd them gently, it says in the Old Testament. A relevant discipleship. Now listen, God's promised to pour water on him, that is. Promised to pour his spirit upon our seed. Humility comes before honor. Humility comes before honor. Thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. He said, I dwell in the high and holy place. But he said, I also dwell with him that is of a humble and a contrite spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and revive the hearts of the contrite ones. It's the broken, humble heart that God revives. Openness, brokenness, oneness. If there's no openness, there is no brokenness. If there is no brokenness, there is no unity, biblical unity and restoration in the home and in the church. We had a prayer advance one year. Had a guy that worked with uh, Amish people in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. By the way, I like Berlin better than Lancaster. I'll just tell you that right now. But, but uh, he worked with these Amish people, and he looked like an Amish person. He had that beard, you know, down to here. Had these clothes. I'm pretty sure they were homemade. Because I don't even think Kmart would have clothes that look quite like that. I just, I, I, I just, I, I just, but he, he was uniquely uh, uh, dressed. And, but he worked with these folks. And, 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 and I felt impressed. For some reason, he wasn't scheduled to speak. But I felt impressed to have him speak. So I asked him. And guess what his subject was? Revival in the home. Well, he stood up and spoke. And he spoke out of Malachi. And then he spoke out of... Uh, Isaiah 58, they that be of thee shall build up the old waste places, and thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the paths to dwell in. He wasn't a pulpit pounder. He wasn't an orator. He just opened up his heart, shared these texts, 
that I'd heard. Isaiah 44, 3, God poured in his spirit upon our seed. He just talked from his heart. Well, when he finished, he sat down, no piano, no invitation. 90% of the men immediately fell on their faces and began to sob and weep. And this went on for an hour. Praise God, it ruined our schedule. And you know when God hijacks a service, that's some of the best services you can have. You know what was going on right there? God was turning the hearts of the fathers to the children. Boy, I'm glad I was in that meeting, preacher, and I'm telling you, I'm just glad I was in that meeting. And you know what? After that, we saw many of the hearts of those children turn back toward the fathers. Prodigals came home. Miracles happened. Restoration took place. Oh, listen, friend. Humility, humility precedes honor. I begin to wonder, how come God showed up when this guy spoke? He wasn't even on the docket. <laughs> and he had two boys with him, 12 and 17. You know what they've been doing for three days? Praying and fasting with their father. 12-year-old boy fasting for three days? Serious? Oh, all those buffets uh, they, they have up there. I, I'm, for three days, here they are, fasting. 17-year-old boy fasting. Why? Because the children, not always, but... It does seem that many tend to love what the parents love, and they tend to uh, treasure what the father treasures. I thought, well, no wonder uh, God showed up because uh, he's, he, he's commanded his children after him, like Abraham. And, and God did a turning work. I'm so thankful I was in that meeting. Listen, friend, strong families don't just happen. They've got to be built, and we've got to build on the right foundation. So the foundation stones are relevant discipleship. Relevant discipleships. I want to ask you this morning as a church member here. Are you growing in Christ? How many of you know there's more to live in the Christian life than tithing, not drinking, not smoking, not going to movies, abstaining from behaviors, and checking off the blocks? How many understand there's more to walking with God than abstention and compliance and conformity to externals? How many know that? Ron Comfort said he didn't know five churches in America where the churches were, were, were still growing. And he said the reason the churches quit growing is because the preachers quit growing. That was his comment. So, brother, it doesn't make any difference whether we're 25 or 85. There's more territory for us to conquer. God wants us to go forward and grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Relevant discipleship. Number two, respectability in daily life. I'm not asking if you're perfect because I know we're not, but I am asking this. Are you an example? And when you mess up, do you fess up? And sometimes you got to pull out those words, you know. Honey, I was wrong. Sorry. Will you forgive me? In fact, I had to pull them out during the couples thing. I had to pull them out myself right there and, and, and get the matter sorted out right on the spot. Respectability in daily life. Number three, regular devotions. Are you meeting God daily? Is God meeting you? <laughs> and then radical dedication. Are you totally surrendered to God? You know, the best definition I've heard of total sur surrender is when you take a blank sheet of paper, you write at the top, my life history, my life history, leave it blank, sign your name at the bottom, hand it over to God, and say, God, here's my life history. You can write it any way you want. Now, that's some definition of total surrender. You know, I did this 40-some years ago. But on occasion, I've had to re-up. Lord, I think I've lost my way, but I'm freshly surrendering everything to you today. God, you write whatever's left, you write it the way you want it. And I'm telling you, brother, when you come to that position, that position of radical dedication, it's fa fantastic. If there's going to be revival in the land, ah, and by the way, let me throw this out. Quit trying to use God to bail out our civilization. Let's seek God for revival for his name's sake and his glory and not the preservation of our lifestyle. Can I get a witness on that very good point? We've been trying to prostitute God uh, to bail us out and preserve all this stuff. Listen to me, my friend. God is worthy whether this country survives or not. And I'm thankful for it. And I'm hoping that for the best. And we're doing what we can. But brother, we're a long ways down the wrong road. You know that. We're not at a crossroads. We're a long ways down the wrong road. And we need revival for the glory of God's name no matter what happens here. 
And if you find that offensive, you got an idolatry problem. I think we need to quit soft soaping on some of this stuff and tell it like it is. Let me get back to the sermon right here. Now, l- l- listen to this. If there's going to be revival in the land, there's got to be revival in the church. And if there's going to be revival in the church, there's got to be revival in the home. Disunity in the home brings a curse upon the earth. And disunity in the home brings a hindrance in prayer. I'm, I'm just telling you, dwell with your wives according to knowledge. Uh, wives, husbands, here's these directives. Why? That your prayers be not hindered. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm voting for revival in my home. How about you? Would you like to have revival in your home? Oh, dear people, we can. Let's bow our heads for a moment. I got, I got about three or four questions here. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I just wondered this morning, how many husbands, fathers, grandfathers in this service would say, Brother Harold, God has spoken to my heart here this morning. God has spoken to me about my spiritual leadership in my family, in my home. I wonder if there's some husbands, fathers, grandfathers in this meeting that would say, Brother Harold, you know what? Man, I want to go all out for God. I, I want to be what God wants me to be. And I want to take my position of responsible leadership in my family and, 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 and in my home. And Brother Harold, God spoke to me today about being the spiritual leader in my family. And I would really appreciate some prayer for me as a husband, as a father, as a grandfather If God spoke to your heart and you'd like to just be included in a simple prayer right as you stand at your seat, would you just stand to your feet if you'd like to get in on this prayer right now? God spoke to me and I want to be included in this prayer of commitment because I want to lead my family for the glory of God. If God talked to your heart, stand to your feet. We're going to have a prayer in just a moment. We're not coming forward. We're just going to pray. God bless you men. I wonder how many ladies here in this service, mothers, wives, grandmothers, And look, I I know some people are in terrible situations. But sister, be encouraged. Your children can be sanctified through one believing mate. That's what the Bible says. I wonder if there's some moms, some wives, some grandmothers here. That would say, Brother Harold, man, I want to stay sweet. I I want to be a 1 Peter chapter chapter 3 kind of woman. Man, I want to have that influence and, and be godly and God has spoken to me about my influence in, in, in my family, and, and I would like to be included in this prayer as well. Maybe you're in a difficult situation, but you say, Harold, boy, God spoke to me. I want to be a godly wife. I want to be a godly mom. Man, I really want to be a godly grandmother, and I'd like to be remembered in this prayer. God, talk to my heart. Would you join these men that are standing right now? Just stand to your feet as well. We're going to have a special prayer. For moms, wives, and grandmoms, God bless you. One more thing before we pray. I wonder if there's some young people here in this meeting. You know, I didn't talk to teenagers here this morning, but I just wonder if there's some young people here that would say, Brother Harold, you know what? The flesh is appealing. The world is very alluring. But man, I really want to honor God, and I want to honor my mother and father that I might have a long life, and I might have a, 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 a prosperous, successful life. According to Ephesians 6 and verse 1. I wonder if there's some young people here that would say, Brother Harold, uh, I wish I would like to be remembered in this prayer because I don't want to disgrace God and I don't want to disgrace my mom and dad. And I would like to be prayed over this morning that I would be a godly son, a godly daughter. God talk to me and please pray for me too. Would you young people Stand to your feet if you'd like to be prayed for here this morning. We'd like to have a special prayer just for those young people that God's talking to here. Wonderful. Praise God. Praise God. Now I want us to bow our heads right here. Heavenly Father, Lord, look at all these men, fathers, husbands, grandfathers. Oh, God, Lord, oh, Lord, give us, Father, a fresh touch a fresh anointing with your Holy Spirit and a sensitivity to you to walk with you day by day, moment by moment, and to shepherd our families. And Lord, to square things up when things get out of, out, out, out of, out of kilter. Lord, would you bless my brothers? Would you bless our homes? God, would you bless our children and our grandchildren and great-grandchildren for the glory of God? Father, for these dear women, wives, mothers, 
grandmoms. Lord, would you just energize them. God, would you give them something. Some of them, Lord, in terrible situations. Oh, God, help them. Oh, God, fill them. Oh, God, anoint them. Oh, God, encourage their hearts. And, Father, may they have the spiritual power to live that First Peter 3 thing. Like the men, we want to be First Peter chapter 3 men. God, would you just touch our sisters especially. And, Father, for these young people, sons and daughters, Father, I pray your blessing upon the offspring. God, you said you'd pour your spirit upon our seed. God, do it. And, Lord, you said you would pour your blessing upon our offspring. So, Lord, for these, these younger ones, God, would you put your hand upon them? And, God, would you just draw near to their souls? And, Father, you put in their heart they want to honor you. Thank you, Jesus. And they want to honor Dad and Mom. Thank you, Jesus. Father, would you just uh, grant them the spiritual power to stay the course, Lord, and to be faithful and to be uh, diligent uh, in seeking you and your face. Bless our young people. And, Father, would you bless our homes. Thank you. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Here's what I want you to do while you're standing. I want you to talk to the Lord for just a second from your heart about whatever he's talked to you about. I want you to talk to God about what he's talked to you about. And this morning, perhaps, would you just do that first? Just verbalize from, from your heart to the heart of God the earnest desire and prayer of your heart. Just ask him. Now, I wonder if somebody here needs to pull the family aside and pull out those 10 words for revival in the home. I was wrong. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? Now, if you need to have a family huddle, I would encourage you to do this. Maybe even now. But to really to just have, huddle up as a family sometime today before you come back tonight. Just, you know, have a time of seeking God and, and um, sharing of heart and putting things right if things have gone wrong. Hey, just I was wrong. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. Will you forgive me? And then have a season of prayer together. Would you just commit to the Lord to follow through on whatever direction you need to follow through? Those in that class with the pastor this morning, I'll tell you what. Man, my heart got supercharged again about the necessity of having a family altar. I, you can do it, brother, sister. You, you can do this. We even got those little books out there. There's other helps. Uh, our family time with God and other things could be a help to you. Just You just correspond with the Lord. Preacher will come, and he will uh, give us further instructions on our service. But you just talk to the Lord about what you need to do and covenant with God that you're going to follow through.
talking to the Lord, please keep doing that. When you finish praying, if you'd look this way, do not rush, don't hurry. Take your time with the Lord this morning. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. Spirit, till all shall see Christ only always living. Everyone stand with me if you would, please. I led in prayer at the outset of the service and asked the Lord to meet needs, to convict and to exhort and to encourage. Now I ask you, did God answer our prayer this morning? Amen. God speak to you. Why don't we just say it out loud, to, out loud to him in your own words. Tell him, Lord, thank you for speaking to me through your word this morning. Amen. Lord, thank you for speaking faithfully to us today. Amen. You've got another opportunity. I hope you'll come back tonight. If I had plans for Sunday afternoon, I, other than being at church tonight, I'd change them. I would. Now, I don't. I've got plans to be here. But you ought to be here, too. I hope you'll come back 530. Say, so we don't normally come on Saturday night. You know, the roof will, or Sunday night, the roof will not fall in. I promise you, it will not. And uh, some of you here this morning, we're so thankful you've never been here before and see the roof didn't cave in. It's not going to cave in tonight. You can come on back and God will meet needs again through his word. Brother and Mrs. Vaughn, if either of you want to go to the book table or both of you are welcome to do that. And I hope you'll stop by and look at the resources that they have out there. Uh, long before I ever met Brother Vaughn I, or knew anything about him, I had one of his books. It was a family devotional, and I would encourage you to stop by and check some of the, check out some of the resources that they have out there. Let him know how God spoke to your heart through the message. Be back tonight, choir practice at 4.30, service at 5.30 tonight. I sure hope that you will be with us. Let us close in prayer. Father, we love you and thank you for your faithfulness to speak to our needs through your word. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us not soon forget the challenge that we've received for our homes. And Lord, I pray that every person in here would walk out determined by your grace to respond to the Bible principles that were presented. Some of our folks in here are single. Lord, some are widowed and widowers, and Lord, some live alone. And yet, Father, I pray that every individual believer today was determined by your grace to live by these principles. And uh, Lord, I do pray that in our homes that you would allow us to see revival continue and flourish. And uh, Lord, help us not just simply to be able to retain uh, those in our home, but Lord, help us to be able to influence others for the gospel's sake. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.